Good morning, friends and beloved ones. It is so good to see your faces here this morning. And I'm really grateful to be here on the first Sunday, but second in the series for our preaching on forgiveness. I got to listen to Reverend Tim's sermon from Ash Wednesday. If you didn't, I recommend listening to it. He really gives us a broad stroke and understanding of forgiveness, how it doesn't mean forgetting, how believing and living into forgiveness is all about fresh starts in our lives, and that forgiveness can be easily misunderstood, that forgiveness is a part of every single moment, that it inspires hope for our present and for our future, that forgiveness is integral to being Christian, and that we strive to be forgiven and forgiving. Today, I really hope to shed more light on the being forgiven part. And so if you would take an attitude and a space of prayer and pray with me. Lord God, God of our hearts, bodies, minds, and souls, hide me behind the cross that we may experience you and your infinite wisdom through my words and our meditations. Amen. Excuse me while I mess with this a little bit. And hello to everyone who's like streaming this from home. It's good to see you virtually. Uh, so I decided I'm not preaching on the gospel text. I'm preaching on the Psalm, Psalm 32. When I was looking at the lectionary for this week, I was like, yes, it says forgiveness right there in the Psalm. I don't have to go searching. <laughs> I don't have to go looking for another scripture. Very excited. Um, and so just come into the come into the space of how I do my, my sermoning. I welcome you in today, and so bear with me. I told, I told them all this morning. I was like, I've been in rare form for like a week, and so thank you for being gracious and receiving that, and maybe you'll be forgiving if I go off the rails a little bit. <laughs> um, but I was reading the psalm, and I was struck by the verse, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And I immediately was like, this resonates with me. What is this reminding me of? And I was like, huh, well, I lied to my therapist. I'll just start there. I lied to my therapist, y'all. And when I did it, I was like intentionally silencing like some sin that I have. So I don't know if any of y'all go to therapy counseling, spiritual direction, but um, you know, you go there to air out your feelings, your grievances, your pain, and to work through stuff. And uh, I was doing that with her, and I was like the victim, and I was all the things, and I had all the humility, like, oh, I own my part. And she said to me, <laughs> well, she got me. I think counselors go to like school, and they have a course that's like how to get your client. I think that, like, I think they read up on this because she asked me all the questions. Oh, how are you feeling? Oh, that sounds very hard. Oh, all of the things. And then I'm neatly backed into this corner, and she's like, okay, well, it sounds like maybe you had a part in this. What is that? And she said, how are you working on your, your piece of this, the part where you hurt someone? I was like, uh, I, was, uh, I didn't, no, no, I didn't. I didn't do the thing. What part? I don't have a part, Carol. I don't know. And I just straight up deny, 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 and decided to keep my silence. And I joke about it now because it's hilarious. And I imagine at some point in all of our lives, whether we were kids or now adults, we've like silenced something when we've been called out or lied about something that we feel shame about, right? And so, you know, me, the perfect angel, I'm a chaplain, I don't hurt people. Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped in the heat of summer. Silence really resonates 
And any time I have felt shame or guilt, betrayal, sin that I have perpetrated, I'll let it fester inside of me. I'll make myself sick. And in my clergy group, and Joanne is here, we're reading the book of joy by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And in the chapter about forgiveness, they briefly talk about how feelings of resentment, anger, hostility, when a wrongdoing has occurred, those are destructive emotions. And so when it's us, like the psalmist, those emotions are directed inwards at ourselves. We hate ourselves. And that can have physical and other impacts on our health. I know I've lost sleep. I know maybe many of you have lost sleep over thinking you've done something or you have done something. And I've tried to make it go away all by myself, just suppress, conceal, don't feel, like Elsa says in Frozen, just to traumatize any parents out there who had to watch that movie. But we think about the psalmist, why was the psalmist silent? And many scholars, including Luther, think that it's pride, that we don't want to recognize or acknowledge our sin, right? I'm pious, I'm righteous, I'm a good one, I'm a good person. And this came up, I was FaceTiming my brother this week, 23 years old, um, and I'm talking to him about this, right, because he also is a Bible scholar. No, no, I just love him to all the pieces. So I like to talk to him about this and get his perspective, and he said something to me that really stuck out, and he said, Amanda, like, we don't want to acknowledge our wrongdoing because it sucks that we did a bad thing. We don't want to admit that we did the bad thing. We don't want to be a bad person, right? Just like the people who hurt and betray us, we don't want to be like them because we have strong feelings towards them or towards the system, right? We don't want to feel that about ourselves. We don't want to face that about ourselves. And I was like, very wise, 23-year-old. He's right. We don't want to face that we have fallen short and harmed those that we love, harmed our community, or our environment, whatever it might be, whatever our sin is. Other scholars say the silence that the psalmist like, brings us into, and maybe our own personal silence, could be fear, pain, and depression that keeps us from telling the truth about our sin. And that that silence, no matter what it is, whether it's deliberate, or unconscious that it is the rejection of God's grace. It is, we're saying, no, no, I don't have space for grace right now, I'm not there. And so I just invite you to consider, because this is a season of Lent and Reverend Tim has invited us to meditate and reflect how we can be forgiven and forgiving. And so in the midst of forgiving ourselves and confessing our sin, how, how many of you have rejected grace as you suppress and silence your sin? And so that cycle of being quiet and silent, and you see how much I love to talk, y'all. I'm a big talker. You have to disrupt the cycle of silence by confessing. And that's what the psalmist tells us. They say, I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. We have to bring ourselves at some point to confession. And as some of you know intimately and maybe like sort of just generally, um, I'm a hospital chaplain and so I often may receive confessions from patients but I may not find myself often confessing maybe. And so it did surprise me one day when at work, I was having a conversation with a fellow coworker, a person of color, and we unintentionally sort of ended up confessing to each other and disrupting the silence about a very big shame that we both had and guilt about seeing racism and discrimination in the workplace and our unconscious and even conscious participation in that cycle. Um, we turned to each other in confidence uh, and we broke this silence and we brought light to our own darkness and fears. And what came out of it was this, you know, realization that our silence was born out of 
fear that we would be seen a certain way, seen as that black employee, or in my case, that black woman who's angry and overreacting and emotional, and so I kept silent. Shame then keeps me silent because now I'm participating in a racist system and guilt for internalizing racism, unknowingly and at times shockingly overt. I keep silent. And that fear is that our voices are not enough to herald change in the world. Fear that our voices aren't enough in our backyard, in our front yard, in our home court. Fear that we don't live up to trailblazing black leaders who went before us. I realized I was silent. I didn't feel like I could even lift my hands to the Holy One. I didn't feel like I was enough. Because if I say it out loud, I am that thing. I am the bad deed. I am the mean-spirited person. I am the black woman who has internalized racism and sexism and homophobia. And if I confess, in that conversation, it's like, if I confess, if you confess, if we confess, maybe we'll be able to breathe and to be seen and to be forgiven, maybe. And there are certain people in my life that I confess to, people that I trust, who hold me accountable, who love me and who show me the face of God. My mom, who's sitting here, for those of you live stream, she's sitting here. I look at her and Earlier, my dad was at the 9 a.m. service and I could look at him. I always go to my parents and I look at my mom and it's like she never turns me away. I come to her, mom, <laughs> I have done a thing. Oh my gosh, I've done a thing. And she doesn't just love me and is like, oh, it's okay. She's like, mm. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't do that. I love you. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it, right? And I ask her for her wisdom, not because I want to just confess and run, but because I want to really change, because I'm ready to heal, maybe. And it's such a blessing to have like parents that can do that, friends that can do that. And so when we think about confession, I just want to encourage you, because it may look different for you, right? We're all coming from different places. We have different family systems. We have different networks of connection of how we hold ourselves accountable. So maybe confession for you is a prayer, like the prayer that we're praying for Lent, this prayer of confession and service. Maybe it is journaling. Maybe it is your best friend in all the world. Maybe it's your pastor that you're confessing to, a chaplain when you're in the hospital, your spouse, your cousin. Womanist theologian Dr. Katie Cannon would say that forgiveness in confession, it's not easy. It's not immediate. It's part of healing. Forgiveness is a part of healing. Confession is a part of healing. In the face of betrayal, sin, oppression, injustice. And it's actually a wild act of self-love to come to terms with your own and acceptance of self. The truth about forgiveness is this piece, that it is part of our healing process. And so who knows what that looks like for each and every one of us. Healing is so specific to each of our situations. The psalm, we go from wasting away in silence to being surrounded by songs of deliverance and liberation. But there's a process there. We're not just immediately there. This is what I love about the Psalms. The Psalms affirm the fact that we're like, ah, right? It's a lot. It's a lot. Life is hard. We mess up all the time. And the Psalm, in the same, in the same just poetry, right, we eventually see the deliverance. But we know that no matter where we might be in that process, it is affirmed in the, in the text. It's affirmed. And so since forgiveness and healing go hand in hand, there's no timeline. That includes how we forgive ourselves, how we confess to God. There is no right way to do this. 
And it, even though it's integral to being Christian, it may be a lifetime to work on something like this in ourselves. And if you're wondering about when I lied to my therapist, because I know you're curious, um, I did, I mean, I eventually did confess to her and it was hilarious. She was like, I said, Carol, uh, I lied to you and I, I um, am very sorry. She was like, oh, <laughs> do you want to talk about it? She's like, do we need to unpack that? Do we need to dig into that maybe? And I was like, oh yeah. But you see, I had to be ready for healing. I had to be ready to move to the next stage of transformation and changing my own behaviors. And it didn't happen, it wasn't the next session. I think it was like maybe two or three sessions later. Bless her heart, she puts up with me. And so, when we think about our healing, anyone who's had an actual wound on their body or a scratch, or you work in healthcare so you've seen it, we know that physical wounds and healing can be itchy and bloody and scabby and kind of gross. So why would our spiritual healing look any different? It's gonna be messy, itchy, or uncomfortable. And so lastly, what this psalm offers us is probably the most radical and fantastic part, which is that God is just straight up waiting for us to come to her. God's like, I'm here, just whenever you're done, just come on over, you wanna to talk to me, I'm ready to forgive you. No holds barred, God will forgive. God is fantastic, God is awesome. The parent of all parents, the creator of creators. It doesn't matter what we do, how bad it is. And this is hard when we think about other people who do bad things, because we're mad. Um, right, it's true, but there is nothing. Transgressions change the framework of our relationships to other people, our relationships to ourselves. It might transform a relationship to our community or to our environment or to another person. But with God, we always can come home to God. God gives us the space to be transformed. And it reminds me of the prodigal son, which I think I knew that mural was down that hallway, but I'm, <laughs> I, today I walked past it and I was like, was that always there? I think it has been always there. But the prodigal child, you know, right, you have all these emotions, you have all these feelings dictating your reality about your sin, and God forgives those feelings, the reality that we've created for ourselves so that we can move on so that we can let go of the emotion, because the action is done. What we carry forward is the guilt and the shame and the feelings, and God forgives that when we're ready. And then we can be different. With work, we can be different. With accountability, we can be different. And so today, beloved ones, just remember that you might be in some space, I guarantee you maybe most of us are, where there's something in ourselves that needs forgiven, something maybe that's sleeping, so maybe you need to self-reflect, something that may be present, something that you have nightmares about, that you lose sleep over. But God is waiting. God is waiting no matter what, no matter what your timeline is, and it's okay for you to be where you are whether that's the silent stage, or the confession stage, or the stage where you're actively working on something, this Lenten season is the perfect time to dig into it. There are transgressions so big that they cause harm to us and our community and the world, but there's no, tra there's no transgression too big for the forgiveness of God, and that's the truth about forgiveness. Amen.